Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vinewood. We're really happy that you can worship with us this morning. Uh, I would like to open by reading from Psalm 145. So if you could please listen while I read, reflect on the words as we read them. We'll be singing a lot of hallelujahs this morning. We're going to be praising the Lord this morning. So hear what the psalmist says, what David says in Psalm 145. He says, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and I shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. This morning, we are singing to the God who shows the greatness of his goodness and of his works, especially at the cross, when he demonstrates his righteousness and his love in the death and resurrection of his son for our sake. So let's stand together this morning as we sing.
What is our hope? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong Who holds our days within His hands What comes apart from His command And what will keep us to the end The love of Christ in which we stand Oh, sing our open life and death Pleasures can calm the troubled soul God is good God is good where is his grace and goodness known in our great redeemer's blood who holds our faith when fears arise who stands above the stormy trial who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore the rock of Christ. So sing, oh sing, hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh sing, hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our open life and death. To the grave. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. Then we will rise and meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast on endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing hallelujah now and our open life and When rocks cry out to worship Whose glory taught the stars to shine Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing But there's joy 
is mine With a thousand hallelujahs We magnify your name You alone deserve the glory The honor and the praise Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours A thousand hallelujahs A thousand die for a redemption whose resurrection means our rise there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done but I have eternity to try with a thousand Father, you deserve all our praise. You deserve all of our worship. Lord, we thank you that you and you alone are to be glorified, honored, and magnified. That you, Lord, desire for you to be lifted up in glory and majesty. Lord, we're so thankful that through that, that great desire, for you to be glorified, you chose to glorify yourself through loving us. And the majesty and lavishness of that great love that we come before you and we've seen and we experience and we know through this great redemption where you sent your son to live, to die as a substitute for the penalty that we all deserved. And you took away the penalty, the wrath, our very consequence because of our own sin and our re own rebellion, 
that we sung this morning. That because of your great love, you've redeemed us to yourself. Where we can now come before you and sing that our only hope is in you. And our hope is found in your son, Jesus. Now we can sing hallelujah with hearts full of praise and joy because we are no longer condemned and we're no longer under your wrath, Lord. It is glorious and majestic and you deserve all the hallelujahs, a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. And Lord, we want to lift up our members to you this morning. We want to pray for those who are currently ill and sick, Lord, the members in our midst, and even some of our members that have been suffering with long-term illness, Lord. We pray for endurance and strength. We pray for joy in the midst of these just great difficult times. We pray for family members as well in their care, we pray that you fill them and lift them up. We pray for young families, Lord, in the English and in the Chinese congregation. Lord, we thank you that you have given them this great privilege to disciple their children and this great privilege to be parents. I pray, Lord, that you continue to encourage parents, strengthen them, Give them resolve during difficult and hard times. We pray for children with soft hearts to receive your word as they have opportunities week after week and day after day to hear your gospel, Lord. We pray that parents would have the encouragement and reminder to continually preach the gospel to their kids through how they parent and discipline, how they love, how, how they care. We pray for those in our midst who are not parents, that they will see and participate, the members will participate in, in loving and showing the gospel to uh, these younger ones, these younger generation in, in our midst, Lord. Now we can all participate in raising up this generation to sing and praise and love you. We pray for our students in our midst. We know, Lord, that uh, this is a time of midterms and studies and a lot of pressure, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in this time that they would not take their eyes off of you. We pray for the members that might feel that they just need to exert a little bit more time and effort in their studies. I pray, Lord, that they will still carve out time in worship and in praise and knowing you, Lord. We pray that the community will gather around and support one another during this time as they go through this just season of uh, study and season of um, just working through uh, these, these tests, Lord. We pray for our members who are currently um, just struggling, maybe relationally or personally or whatever it may be, Lord. We want to lift them up to you. We pray that for all of us as the members of this church would live up to our covenant promises to one another to encourage, to exhort, to care, to be selfless. We pray for a heart of evangelism, Lord, as we go through Missions Month. I pray, Lord, that you give us a stronger resolve to see our neighbors, our friends, and the nations come to know you. We want to continue to pray for the different organizations that we had an opportunity to be a part of and participate in and hear about. For our friends at uh, Bay Area Rescue Mission or GLEC, we thank you so much, Lord, uh, just for that opportunity for us to hear what they do. We pray for the continual gospel to be preached. We pray for our friend and our brother, Matthew Blevins and JCC. We thank you for just his encouragement for us as well. And lastly, Lord, this morning we want to pray for our brother Stephen as he brings the word. We thank you so much for his uh, work in ministry in Sacramento. 
uh, and with the crew, Lord, and I pray that this time that the congregation will be encouraged uh, by what, uh, by, by his preaching and what he brings forth. So I pray, Lord, for eyes to see, for hearts to hear, or for <laughs> for ears to hear and hearts to receive your word. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You may have a seat. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for joining us in worship this morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Dennis. I am one of the pastors here on staff, and I'll be giving the announcements for you uh, this morning. Uh, if this is your first time here, I want to uh, first welcome you. Thank you for visiting us. You are visiting us in the midst of Missions Month, and so we have carved out the month of October to be introduced to various type of missionaries, uh, local and even just not so local as you'll see today and just an opportunity for us to hear what the Lord does in different areas and different organizations and people's lives so uh, if you're visiting this is not our normal kind of uh, rhythm we will be returning to the book of Matthew in the beginning of November and and so you will be able to get a maybe a, a clear uh, idea of what we we're about then but we are excited to be able to um, have this kind of month to be able to focus on missions. And for us, what does that mean for us uh, personally? And what does it mean for us corporately as a church? Uh, we have a, a, we don't have a slide for this, but I do want to uh, let you all know that in the beginning of November, so two Sundays from now, uh, we will have a membership class. And so if uh, you are here and you are not a member and you're interested in what membership is like here at Vinewood CFC, we want to encourage you uh, to attend this class. A membership, a covenant membership is really important for us here at not only the English congregation, Vinewood CFC, but also our sister congregation, the Chinese congregation, and our kind of greater church, Chinese for Christ, Berkeley. Uh, we take our membership seriously here and our covenant as well. And our responsibility. And so if you are interested and maybe you have questions about what membership looks like here, uh, I would encourage you to attend that class. Or if you know a member at this church, I have the great confidence that if you ask one of the members of our church, they will tell you and share with you the importance of membership here. We have been uh, really uh, encouraging this our congregation for many, many years on what membership looks like what covenant membership looks like, what encouraging, exhorting, and responsibility looks like here at Vinewood CFC and at Chinese for Christ, Berkeley. Um, next is we have, uh, if you are uh, new here, we want to get you connected and like uh, we want to get to know you a little bit better. So you would receive a, you should have received a card or online that you can fill out uh, for us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we don't want, we're not going to spam you or anything, but we want to be able to kind of open ourselves up and give opportunities for you to get to know us a little bit better and for you to be able to ask your questions. So we just ask uh, if you would kindly fill out that card for us um, and so we can connect with you. We promise we won't spam you. Uh, we, don't, we, only, we will only email you uh, from personal people and let you know uh, who we are and what we're about and any questions you might have. Uh, we would just love to get to know you a little bit better, but also for you to get to know us a little bit better as well. So if you have any questions, concerns, thoughts, whatever it is, we are always happy to hear from you. Uh, if you have any, um, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, we have prayer meeting at the first, uh, at, at, um, first thing every Sunday at 8 a.m. And so we meet here on Sunday. Uh, at 8 a.m. for a prayer meeting in one of our upper rooms. And so if you are interested, we want to encourage you to join us in our prayer meeting. And uh, on top of that, if you can't come this early, uh, we also have a Zoom link available online. So you can join us via Zoom uh, for prayer as well. So we want to encourage uh, all the members, um, as, uh, as our former deacon uh, Richard has encouraged all the members to try to come to our prayer meeting Perhaps maybe like, uh, I think it's like once a semester, once a quarter. Uh, but for all the members, we want to encourage you to come and join uh, our prayer meetings as often as you can. If you have any uh, offering or uh, tithes, we want to encourage you to donate uh, via PayPal or Zelle. Uh, we want to make it super easy uh, for you. So you can find the links on our website under the tab Give. 
and you can find all the information on um, what uh, on how to offer uh, via PayPal or Zelle. So, uh, that's uh, lastly, we today we have uh, a friend of mine, Stephen, uh, who will be joining us today. He has come and spoke before uh, during pandemic, so he was on Zoom, and uh, it was I knew that it was really encouraging for me because. Uh, we have people had you know requested him to return, so no pressure. <laughs> now that you're in person, but also you also gave a evangelism class afterwards as well that people came. So we we're just like I'm. I am personally just very thankful that uh, you know you came and served our community, especially during a time of pandemic. Um, so we're just so grateful for Stephen, uh, Stephen and Sam Mockford. Um, they currently live in Sacramento. I know the family because his wife went to. Um, my old church uh, back in Hayward. She grew up there. We didn't overlap, but we had a lot of mutual friends, and uh, they served overseas uh, as missionaries for many, many years, uh, which we were so uh, grateful to see just kind of their example in that. Uh, that was cut abruptly short. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Stephen can share about that personally, but it was cut abruptly short, and we had the privilege and honor and just be able to uh, connect more after that as well. Uh, he currently serves in crew, where my family and I have the privilege of uh, supporting them as well. So we're just so thankful not only of um, what they have done uh, abroad and now locally, which you will obviously share more about, uh, but even he drove from Sacramento to come to preach to us. Uh, so out of all the people that have come, he has come the longest. He's dri driven the longest. So please give him a very warm welcome uh, as, um, as we welcome Stephen here. Thanks, Pastor Dennis. Uh, yeah, I bring you guys greetings from the faraway country of Sacramento. Um, travel all the way just to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, but seriously, thanks for the invitation, and I'm honored to be here uh, with you all this morning and to be able to open God's word together. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I think there should be a, a PowerPoint up there. Um, I want to share a little bit about my family. They weren't able to, to join me today, but... Um, that's, that's, that's my family. That's uh, the summer. We were up in uh, Tahoe for a few days just to, able to relax a little bit. And so that's my wife, Sam, and she, um, she and I have been married. We just celebrated 12 years uh, back in August. And so we have, and we have two kids, two boys. There's a lot of wrestling going on in our house. So that's uh, our oldest is Gus. He is eight years old. And our youngest is Max. And he will turn six uh, on Friday. So, uh, yeah, between his birthday and Halloween, um, there's going to be a lot of sugar in my house, so you can be, that's a, there's a prayer request right there. Uh, please pray for my family. Um, as Pastor Dennis mentioned, uh, I work uh, with an organization called Crew. Uh, I do college ministry. And so um, I've served in a variety of different places, but really the, the overall purpose, uh, the reason why Crew exists is um, as a college ministry to give every student in the world an opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's basically what I got involved with uh, as a student and as I graduated and uh, joined staff with Crew, uh, I've been doing that. And so now I serve in Sacramento. And really our, from the team that I work on, um, our goal is to equip students with the gospel so that students can go out and impact the rest of the world. Um, I got involved with Crew actually during my time here at Berkeley. Um, I, was, I was a student here and um, really came in not following Jesus, uh, but having some church background. But during my freshman year, God really met me there. And really, I began to understand more deeply what the gospel was really about, what grace was, and um, started a personal relationship with Christ that year. Um, and just really saw the beauty of what Jesus has done for us and what he offers for us. Uh, in the gospel. And so um, it was actually here in Berkeley that I started taking my st first steps of faith, um, learning how to follow Jesus, learning how to talk with others about Jesus, and even hearing about missions. And so I graduated in 2007, uh, back when I uh, had a lot more hair and a lot less beard. Um, but yeah, I graduated with a degree in rhetoric and then joined staff with Crew, and I've served in a variety of locations, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. So I served for a few years uh, when I f was first married at UC Davis, and then served for nine years in East Asia. Um, and we say East Asia because it is a, a secure country, uh, 
creative access country, as we sometimes call it. Um, but basically, for security reasons, I can't share the name. But uh, I'll share some stories about my time in East Asia. And then most recently now, we, uh, my family is in Sacramento, where I'm just going into my fourth year. Uh, and so it's been a wild ride with uh, moving and the pandemic and all that stuff. But um, yeah, excited to be here with you guys this morning. Uh, the purpose of, of the team that I work on and just the ministry in Sacramento, because we have uh, a unique situation with Sac State and with community colleges, is we really just see ourselves as a launch pad for equipping students to walk with Jesus and to live uh, on mission for a lifetime. So however long they're with us, we, we are praying that as they graduate or transfer out or wherever they're going next, that they would continue to walk with the Lord and continue to have an impact uh, for the Lord's kingdom wherever they go. As I mentioned, for me personally, uh, my involvement in missions really began here in Berkeley and it began when I was a student. Uh, as a freshman, when I started to follow Christ, uh, started to see just the work that he was doing in my life and how good the good news of Jesus really is, uh, I began to also realize how lost the world is. How, as I looked around me in the dorms, as I walked around campus, as I looked at um, other students in my classes, just realizing that the gospel wasn't just for me, but that uh, Christ came to rescue the world, and that that good news, that invitation, is for everyone. And so it was uh, during that time that I also started hearing about unreached people groups around the world and what God was doing through world missions. And so that's really how I got started. Now, I know that missions can make people nervous. Uh, it's a lot easier when we talk about following Jesus when we're mostly just talking about like forgiveness, grace, all those things that make us feel nice inside, our acceptance, right? Uh, even talking about meaning and purpose. Okay, I, as a rhetoric major, I, I studied a lot of philosophy. I'm all about like, what's the meaning of life? You know, what's, what's our purpose? Um, but when we start talking about what Jesus actually wants us to do with our lives, this call to make disciples. I know you guys were, I think, lo looking at Matthew 28 last week the Great Commission, Jesus' call to make disciples of all nations, suddenly it feels a little bit less uncomfortable, or a little less comfortable, right? Uh, we feel a bit nervous about this idea of being sent out. And so we start to have fears arise in our hearts, and we start wondering, you know, does God really have a good plan for my life? Is he going to make me do stuff that I don't want to do? I honestly know so many missionaries who serve in different African countries who at some point in their lives specifically prayed that God would not send them as a missionary to Africa. But, uh, and recently I was even reading a book on family and marriage and there's a chapter on singleness and it opened with these words, only, the only call of God that Western Christians fear more than the call to missions is the call to a life of celibacy. And honestly, sometimes a call to missions can mean a life of singleness. I'm just going to be honest. It's, it's not easy. There is a cost. Sharing the gospel, crossing cultures, learning a new language, making disciples is not easy work. It can lead to awkwardness, loneliness, rejection, and depending on where you serve, even persecution or death. As, as Pastor Dennis was alluding to, my, my family actually, we served in East Asia for nine years. And one of the reasons why we are back is because we were forced to leave. And so we were given four days uh, to pack up our apartment. And the four of us had to get on a plane and come back to the US. And Pastor Dennis's family actually was kind enough to pick us up at the airport and help us get settled back in. And so we're very grateful for that. But I acknowledge that missions comes with a cost. And so perhaps you've felt the same as you think about God's calling in your life. As you've been sitting, I'm aware that we're week, you guys are week four into missions month, and so here's another sermon about missions. Um, <laughs> but I want you to know that you're not alone in your feelings. You're not alone if you have worries and doubts. The text that we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see that uh, Jesus meets the disciples in those same feelings, those same doubts. They felt the same way, and yet Jesus met them there, and Jesus still sent them out. So the main idea that I want you guys uh, to walk away with, if you remember nothing else that I say, is that because the Father has sent the Son and the Spirit to bring us to himself, so we, are to, we too are sent out on mission to the world. If you have your Bibles with me or you want to follow along in the PowerPoint, we're going to be looking at, at John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20, reading verses 19 through 23. 
Let me, uh, I'll read that for us. So on, <clears throat> starting in verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first, week, uh, first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Yeah. Open just before a word of prayer before we dive in. Jesus, thank you for uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you met the disciples and uh, and even how you promised to meet with us here this morning. I pray that as we unpack this text, as we look at um, the gospel message and what that means for our lives, Jesus, would you encourage us? Uh, encourage our hearts. Uh, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to understand uh, what we're reading, what this meant for the disciples, and even what it means for us today? And would you use uh, the words of my mouth uh, to just uh, encourage and build up uh, your body, Lord? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there are three, this is a really short passage, but there are three key ideas that I want to unpack out of here. The first is that Jesus holds himself up as the model for our being sent. Two, we see that he also gives us the means for being sent. And three, he also shows us a little bit more implicitly the motivation that we have for being sent out. So first, let's look at the model. Jesus is the model for our being sent. So the context of what we just read, we're we're kind of jumping in at the end of the story in the book of John, This is after Jesus' work has already been accomplished. He's gone to the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again. And we find the disciples living in fear. They're, uh, according to verse 19, right, they're locked away in uh, in this upper room. Uh, They're hiding for fear of the Jews. And this is despite the fact that if we had started at the beginning of the chapter, Peter and John have actually already gone out and seen the empty tomb and believed. Jesus has already appeared to Mary Magdalene, who then went and told the disciples. And yet there is still fear, still confusion about what they are to do, uh, fear of what will happen to them. They have doubts and need comforting following this story, right? We come across the story of Doubting Thomas. That's a really sad nickname that that he's kind of stuck with him. But but we see that they need comfort. They need proof. They need an explanation for what they are to do and what is going on. And I love that in the midst of this fear, in the midst of these doubts, Jesus meets them where they are. He appears in the locked room in verse 19. It doesn't explain why. Um, I have some, some fun ideas, but I won't go into that. Um, but he just suddenly appears, and he, I love that he begins by just addressing their fears with peace. In verse 19 and 21, right, he begins by saying, "My peace, uh, peace be with you. He also shows them his pierced hands and side to alleviate their doubts that this, he is real. This is, he's not a ghost. This isn't like them having a hallucination. But he actually is real. He is really there. They can touch him. They can feel him. He is there in the room with them. He has risen from the dead. And so he doesn't, he doesn't start by telling them that they don't have enough faith or saying he's disappointed in them. But he, he offers his peace and he, he alleviates their doubt, giving them assurance. And the result we see in verse 20 is gladness, right? And they acknowledge him as Lord. And it is in this context that he then sends them out on mission. So as we think about this for ourselves, maybe we have similar struggles today. We wonder, is God good? Is the gospel still good news today? Sometimes when we're out in in culture, in society, it can feel like what we want to share doesn't feel like good news. But is it good news? Can it still bring peace today? Maybe we wonder, what will people think about me if I start talking about Jesus, if I start sharing my faith? I think like the disciples, it's easy for us to begin to hide, maybe not in a locked room, but we can hide our faith through silence, opportunities that God gives us to, to share 
about him and we can remain silent or we can silo ourselves. Maybe, you know, we live in a Christian bubble and we just don't have opportunities because we don't try to, to have relationships with those who need to hear about Jesus. But I love that Jesus meets us where we are and also calls us to so much more, just like the disciples. But the key is that we have to trust him. Uh, during my time in East Asia, I was doing college, college ministry, and we had uh, one student named Lily that started coming to our events her freshman year. <clears throat> uh, Lily is not her real name, but uh, I'll, I'll use that for the story. And Lily came to one of our events. It was a kind of a community um, service event that we were doing uh, in, uh, around the campuses. And she showed up with some friends. I think she was kind of wanting to learn English because uh, it was me and, and some uh, other Americans that were there. Uh, but then uh, some of our East Asian students, uh, one of the older students, actually took Lily aside during the time and shared, shared with her about what it meant, uh, that first, that we were Christians and why we were out doing what we were doing. Um, because we, we love the community, we want to serve the community. And then through that, he actually had an opportunity to share with her about how she too could know God personally through Jesus Christ. And at, at that time, she, Lily decided that she wanted to follow Jesus. And so she prayed and um, began that relationship. She started going to church with him uh, and, and some of the other students that were with us. And it was really exciting. But then within a few weeks, she started realizing that there was a problem with following Jesus, and that was, she was also in this program to join the Communist Party. It's a kind of a, a long program, there's a lot of studying and learning, things you're supposed to do. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits to joining the party over there. You can have access to better jobs, better health care, higher wages. But it also requires that you swear allegiance to the party and that you are an atheist and that you will never, ever believe in God. And so Lily didn't know what to do as a new believer. She wrestled with, she wrestled with uh, whether or not she should continue with the class. Could she make that? But then, you know, maybe there's forgiveness. <laughs> make that commitment. Um, and so she sought guidance um, from her church, uh, from other students. She actually came over to, to our apartment to meet with uh, my wife and with me and to ask about what we thought she should do. And in the end, because she saw the goodness of what Jesus had done for her, and what he offers, she actually chose to drop out of the program and take a step of faith. And that led to many faith-filled conversations, kind of awkward conversations as maybe classmates or friends, roommates were wondering why she um, stopped going, why she wasn't going to um, join the party. But God used that as an opportunity for her to share about her new faith. You see, the, the foundation for our participation in God's mission really begins with our own trust in Jesus despite our fear, um, but as we experience just his good news in our lives, like Lily, or for the disciples, right, in the stories, we see they experience the risen Lord coming to meet with them, giving them peace. And what I love here, as Jesus is our model, is that he roots the Great Commission in himself and in his own work. We see that in verse 21, as he says that uh, as the Father has sent him, right, he is sending out the disciples, so our, our being sent finds its source and its paradigm in Jesus' own work. We're jumping in at the end of the story of John, but John, Jesus had actually used the word sent more than 30 times in the entire book of John. And most of the time, he's referring to himself. That as the Father has, or, So the Father has sent Jesus into the world. So maybe if, if you're familiar with the book of John, there's a, a couple of passages that maybe come to mind in uh, John chapter 6 when Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life. He says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Uh, in John chapter 12, he talks about his purpose in coming to rescue and save the lost, to save the world. He says, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. So we see that for, for, for the disciples, this wouldn't be news to them that Jesus had been sent. He's been talking about this the entire time. But now suddenly there's a change. Jesus isn't just talking about how he was sent from the Father. He's saying that he is sending out the disciples. And so now his mission has become theirs. And that meaning would have been clear to them as they followed him those three years. And so now for us today, it's our turn and that we too are also being sent out. If we follow Jesus, he is saying that we are sent out 
that there is a, a metaphorical relay baton that has been passed down through the ages, through the church, and that now it is our turn to be sent out because people are the conduit that God uses to rescue a lost world. Jesus, or uh, elsewhere in, in the Bible, it talks about how we are Christ's ambassadors. So even as I just read that Jesus said that whoever sees him sees the Father, the Bible also talks about how we represent Christ as we are sent out. And so whoever sees us sees Christ. And so I want you to just, I, yeah, this, key, this is such a key idea that because the Son modeled being sent, so we too are sent out on mission to the world. But Jesus doesn't, doesn't just send us out. He also gives us the means to accomplish the mission. That he gave us the spirit uh, to empower us. And we see that with the disciples. That Jesus didn't just give them the task, he also gives them the means. Christ's mission requires Christ's power. If you think of uh, uh, the Great Commission as we, as we read it in Matthew 28... Uh, Jesus doesn't just send out the disciples to make disciples of all nations. He begins by saying that all authority and power uh, is entrusted to him and that he goes with them. So it's not something that they are sent out to do on their own. And we see that here in John as well, that he, he says that he's sending them out, but he also says that he is giving them the Holy Spirit in verse 22. And ultimately that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit came down. Again, we're jumping in at the end of the book. This is not going to be brand new to the disciples. Uh, Jesus has already talked quite a bit about the coming of the Spirit. In, in chapter 14, he had said that the Father was going to send a helper, that this would be the Spirit of truth. In chapter 16, he talks about how the Spirit will guide them into all truth. And that part of abiding in Christ means recognizing our own weaknesses and our own limitations, that we need power from the true source of life, which can only be found in Christ. And he applies that to our lives through the Spirit. Apart from him, we can do nothing of spiritual significance. The reality is this is a big task that Jesus is calling us to, that he is sending the disciples out to, to accomplish. But we cannot actually live out the Christian life, let alone this mission, or fulfill any of God's purposes without divine power. Our discipleship to Christ must inc it includes purpose, mission, and power. The Holy Spirit empowers us for all of the Christian life. If you, in order to grow and to learn, to understand the Bible, and to understand God's word, we need the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us into the truth, to help us to understand what God has revealed to us. We need the Holy Spirit in order to grow, to actually change, to work in our hearts, to transform us from the inside out. I don't know about you, but I can, like, I can change some of my habits. I can set cell phone alarms to try and be on time to things. There are some things that I can do, but I cannot change my own heart, and none of us can, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And also the Holy Spirit helps us to share Christ, and that, he also makes that clear in other parts of Scripture where he talks about how the Holy Spirit would give the disciples words to speak, to proclaim his message, uh, to defend themselves even um, before uh, earthly authorities. So God gets glory by overcoming our fears by the Holy Spirit's power when we learn to stop trusting in ourselves. Mission and power are always tied together in God's plan. So for me, personal confession time, uh, as a, this might sound funny as a missionary, but um, I'm really bad at this. And I'm actually not that great at doing evangelism because when I, particularly when I do it in my own strength, uh, the reality is that I'm so prone to self-reliance that um, I can be very shy when I'm with people I don't know very well, um, starting new conversations, meeting new people. I can, like my palms get sweaty, my heart starts racing like I'm doing cardio, right? I'm super nervous. On the other hand, I've been working with crew for 15 years. I've had thousands of conversations about Jesus. And so in some ways, trusting myself can also be very rote and mechanical, where I just ask the questions I always ask, have the same conversation over and over and over again. But that's not what God is calling us to either. 
And so the reality is when I trust in myself, I either, on the one hand, I chicken out of having, having conversations, I skip the opportunities that God's giving me, or I just kind of bluster through it, kind of focusing on myself and being super awkward because I'm mostly thinking about myself and not the other person, or I spend time just talking too much, not listening to the other person, um, maybe seeing them as, a, as a, a project or a task that I just need to check off and move on. But what I need is actually the Holy Spirit to give me both the strength and the courage to represent him and to share Christ, but also the perspective of being loving and gracious and slowing down and seeing where he is at work and trusting him in this conversation, not, not my own strength or my own experience or maybe... A, trusting in uh, things that I've done before. And this same power, God has definitely used that in my life to, to even in the middle of a conversation, to just pull back and recognize that I need him to, to work through me. And that same power is actually available for everyone who follows Christ. Uh, a quick story about a, a student who's involved in our, our ministry in Sacramento, Caitlin. She is a sophomore at Sac State. and She just actually went on her first uh, summer mission trip this past summer. She's, she's a quiet uh, Asian student from Southern California, and last semester through her involvement with crew, or last year through her involvement with crew, she started hearing about international missions and hearing about God's heart for the world. And so she felt like from that, that meeting, she started wondering, is this something that maybe God's calling me to take part in? So by faith, she learned how to start sharing her faith, because she'd never done that before. Started, uh, she applied or sorry, first she actually had to talk to her parents about it, which I was like, I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, <laughs> freshman, freshman girl just, yeah, just want, wants to go overseas. And um, so she had to talk with her parents. She had to apply for the trip. She went on, uh, she had to raise a few thousand dollars in order to get the, the tickets to go, to spend four weeks there for housing and food. And then she went and saw God use her to share the, share the good news of Jesus with Muslim women uh, Muslim college students overseas. And none of those steps really would have been possible in her own strength. That each step of the way, she needed the Holy Spirit's power to learn how to share the gospel with others, to take a step of faith and talk to her parents, to raise the money to go, and then to actually go and see God use her in the lives of the women that she talked to. So the key idea here is that because the Holy Spirit was sent to empower us, so we too are sent out on mission to the world. Okay, lastly, my last point is that Jesus also implicitly shows us here the motivation for mission, for our being sent. And that is that God's blessings have been extended to us. The story of the Bible is a story of relationship, of God creating and redeeming a people for himself. And Jesus came to fulfill that plan through his death and resurrection. And so as we, as we jump into this text here, right, this is after the resurrection, we, we see that that has been already fulfilled. We see that through relationship, presence, and forgiveness. Jesus comes and engages with his disciples, right? He engages them in relationship. He meets them where they're at. He comforts them in their fears, right? He, he offers his presence, not only there in the room with them, that he comes to be with them, but also that he sends his spirit to live in them, that as they are sent out, they do not go alone, that he goes with them through the spirit, we also see that he offers the blessings of, those relationship, of this relationship, which is also his forgiveness, that his work on the cross brings forgiveness of sin. And so the mission that the disciples receive and that now we receive is an extension of his mission. It's an extension of this relationship and the blessings that they receive from Christ. Now, authorization to extend that, the blessing of forgiveness is seen clearly in verse 23, that, that that forgiveness is not for these disciples alone, but it's for all for others as they proclaim this good news. And we are to draw our motivation from the same source. As we experience God's love, it is an overflowing love that moves us to share with others. As we experience forgiveness, it allows us to forgive others or to see where others need to hear a message of forgiveness. When we see the brokenness of the world, it should not drive us to anger, but to compassion and to see that the good news that we have experienced is good news that others need to hear as well. During my time, uh, the, the, the way that my wife and I met was actually on a summer mission. Um, this is not necessarily a plug for mission trips, but I mean, <laughs> not a bad idea. Um, 
but we met on a summer mission when she was a student at Davis and I was going to Berkeley and we met, we were on the same team for the summer going to East Asia. Um, that's literally how we met. She, she always wants me to have the caveat, like we didn't start dating for another two years. It's a big team. We didn't know each other that well. But uh, anyway, the point is we were both struck by just the spiritual need in East Asia. My wife, Sam, um, one, one day she, she was in the cafeteria for lunch and she, got, uh, she was meeting with a student, so she got her tray with some, some rice and a simple stir fry and just sat down with this girl and started talking with her, getting to know her. And it, at one point she asked, my wife asked her, what do you think about Jesus? And to this, the student actually looked at her kind of with a blank look in her, in her face and said, I don't know what a Jesus is. And I think that, that just really struck, struck my wife that not only did this girl not know what Jesus had done for her, she was not even aware that he was a person. And so my wife took that opportunity to be able to, to share with her how, who Jesus was, all that he had done, and how she could know him too. And she decided right there in the cafeteria to place her faith in Christ and follow Jesus. She decided to believe this good news. And that's one of the reasons why we went back later long term and why I served in East Asia for nine years because the reality is there's no shortage of people in the world that need good news. There are, there are people, people groups out there, there are, there are places in the world where people have never heard of Jesus. And if you ask them, they would say they don't know what a Jesus is either. There are places in the world where Jesus is just a footnote in a history book that they read for class once, but they have no idea the significance of his, of his life and his death, and his resurrection. They don't know the meaning behind that. Instead, they live under just constant pressure and stress to perform, to compete. The weight uh, of that is just a burden that we all live under in this world, trying to make something of ourselves. And it can lead to either pride or despair. And so people all over the world need good news. They need to hear about grace, about God's forgiveness, that we can't earn it on our own. People all over, the, all over the world need to hear this. And so our motivation, right, is looking to Jesus, but also seeing the needs of the world, that these blessings that we experience can be offered to them as well. So because the blessings of God, this relationship, presence, forgiveness, have been extended to us, so we are sent out on mission to invite others in as well. So in closing, I just want to ask, what does it mean that we also are sent well, because the, the son modeled being sent, I just want to ask, if you're here this morning and you haven't um, placed your faith in him, I want to ask, have you begun that relationship with Christ? If not, I invite you to respond that Jesus was sent on a mission and his, this missionary God came to give you new life in him. And you can do that. You can experience that by placing your faith in him this morning and beginning that adventure. If you already are following Jesus, then I encourage you to imitate and become more like Christ, not only in the things that he do, did, but even in his heart and his purpose towards others. Spend time in the Gospels reflecting on his heart for the lost and for the spiritually dead and asking how is he calling you to take part in this same mission? Because the Holy Spirit was sent to empower us, I want to encourage you that we cannot be sent out depending on our own strength or our own wisdom. So are you going, are you going out? Are you going out of these doors trusting in the Holy Spirit to guide you or in your own strength? Are you trusting him to empower you moment by moment to live the Christian life and to live on mission? The Bible also talks about the Holy Spirit and how he gives us gifts to serve him and to build up the body. And so my question also is, how is he empowering you to serve? Is he calling you to pray for the, the work of missions locally here, here in the Bay Area, in the U.S., or internationally? Is he is he calling you to give uh, of your money to those who are serving and, and doing that, that work? You can support them financially and in prayer. Or is he calling you to go? And lastly, because the blessings of God have been extended to us, I want to ask, are you in awe of that fact that you too have been uh, made a part of God's people and that you experience those blessings? When you look out and you read the news, are you broke? does the brokenness of the world spur you towards compassion. I encourage you to take time regularly to look at how Jesus' work is good news in your own life. How is Jesus good news to you this week? How has he met you? 
and then look for opportunities to personally extend that gospel invitation to others around you. So in closing, again, the main idea is that because the Father has sent the Son and the Spirit to bring us to himself, so we too are sent out on mission to the world. When I first joined staff with Crew, I ended up at UC Davis, and I started working with a senior named Keith. And at that time, he was, wrestling, he was about to graduate, and he was wrestling with a call to full-time ministry and that he would have to raise support. Now, Keith is one of, those, one of those guys I talked about at the beginning who specifically prayed that he would never be sent out to Africa. And yet, he was, as he was graduating, he, was, uh, he felt like he was being called to go to South Africa. And so in college, uh, he began to understand the gospel, began to understand the spiritual needs in the world. And when he graduated, he and his wife decided that they, or they, they felt called to live as those being sent out on mission. And so God actually sent them for it, like I said, for a season to South Africa to serve with crew. They since then have returned to the U.S. and they served for a number of years in Arizona and just working, to, working with college students, sending college students out on short-term missions, long-term missions. They actually brought a few teams to our, our city when my wife and I were overseas, um, bringing students to come serve in East Asia to see what God was doing there. And now Keith currently serves as an executive pastor in Tucson, where he's continuing to participate in the mission and is actually currently going, undergoing assessment to be sent out yet again as a church planter. And so being sent can take, like Keith even, it can look a lot of different ways, depending on where you go, how long you're there, what the ministry looks like. But we are all called to be sent. And so I encourage you to consider God's leading in your own life today. Like the disciples in John 20, or like my friend Keith, are you willing to follow Jesus' model and command to be sent out to pray, give, or go however the Lord is asking you to? How is Jesus calling you to be sent on mission? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity to worship you and to hear from you this morning in your word. Jesus, thank you that you are a missionary God, that you did not stay in the comforts of heaven, but you were sent to the earth to rescue us, to make a way for us to know you, to be in relationship with you, that we too can experience this relationship, this, your presence in our lives, the forgiveness and love that you offer us. And Jesus, thank you that you also give us purpose as you send us out to make disciples of the nations, that you send us out, you go with us, through the Holy Spirit. Thank you that, uh, that this invitation is not for us alone, that we can rejoice as we get to share it with others as well. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing in response. our hearts may Jesus Christ be known wherever we are we ask not for ourselves but for your renown the cross has saved us so we pray your kingdom come let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth, till your sovereign work on earth is let your kingdom come Give us your strength, O oh God And 
courage to speak. Perform your wondrous deeds through those who are weak. Lord, use us as you want, whatever the test. By grace we'll preach your gospel till our dying breath. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done, so that everyone might know your name. Let your soul be your kingdom come let your will be done so that everyone might know your name oh let your soul be heard everywhere on earth till your soul your kingdom come. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Very encouraging for myself. Hopefully it was very encouraging for you. I think I want to encourage some of the college students this morning. Like, What if the Lord called you here at UC Berkeley to be equipped and sent out for missions? What if the Lord calls us to per- prestigious schools so he can send the best and not the leftovers. Um, just so, just reminded me, just so grateful right, that Stephen came here and stepped these, this very campus to be sent out. What, what if some of you who go, well, I got a full time job already, well, what, what do I do? I think of our intern, Matthew, who was a software engineer, high paying job, quit his job to go into the work of the ministry. What if it's just reaching out to your neighbors, your friends, your coworkers, your family? I know I've been really encouraged and hope you're encouraged too. Would you bow with me as I go back and grab my Bible? <laughs> just so excited to share that because it was just so encouraging for me, but would you bow with me? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. According to the power I work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a privilege to be able to worship God together this morning. Have a very blessed week. Look forward to seeing you again next week. I love you.